Okay, beautiful. Is it on my presentation? Yes, it is. Uh, okay. Press present, that should do it. Yep, and you are ready to go. Once again, Alex Elmore uh, is from St. Louis University. He's gonna talk about an analog-based severe probability guidance. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Jim. Yes, as he said, I'm, uh, I guess, going to talk about this new version of the guidance that we've uh, been working on the last couple of years at SIPS, uh, mainly focused on severe weather. So just the main the main people behind SIPS are, are primarily uh, Dr. Charles Grace from St. Louis University and Dr. Chad Gravel, who is now at the Southern Region headquarters. Uh, myself and Kyle Perez, who is now a forecaster at the Springfield, Missouri WFO, were brought on uh, back in 2016 as graduate students at SLU to work on this specific uh, version of the guidance. Uh, just wanna throw out thank you to the many uh, NOAA and NWS employees who have provided uh, input and feedback over the last couple of years on, on this guidance. And then of course, our research fund uh, through the uh, NOAA Sea Star grant. So bottom line up front, uh, we have an analog-based probabilistic guidance for severe weather hazards at lead times of one to eight days, which is forecast hour 24 through forecast hour 192. This probabilistic guidance is for severe hail, severe wind, tornado, and any severe hazard, or I guess you could say accumulated uh, severe uh, hazards. The guidance does have skill in forecasting severe weather year round through the entire uh, forecast period to a certain extent. We'll discuss more of that later. And there are some seasonal biases and differences in the performance of the guidance uh, that I will also discuss later on. And finally, this new approach will be used for forecasting other hazards and fields within the SIPS analog system. So just to start, why, why analogs, why use analogs and why use reforecasts? Just real quick, an analog is just an observed pattern that is similar to a current model forecast in this, in the, in this case. And a reforecast is a past model forecast that is similar to a current model forecast. And in using both of these historical uh, types of data, if you will, uh, Hamill et al. in 2006 in, in one of their papers that they're really kind of the, the main researchers in the field in terms of using reforecasts and using analogs in an operational sense. And they, they state that it simulates the, pro the forecast process of many humans. We look at the current forecast, recall situations where the forecast depiction was comparable, and try to recall the weather that actually occurred. So that's how we as forecasters, I mean, obviously we all, you know, we went to school, we learned the dynamics and the math behind, you know, what goes on in the atmosphere and, and the results of that. But when it comes to data forecasting, eventually you see certain patterns and conditions enough that, you know, you, you build a library in your head of when you come across similar patterns in the future, you can apply that relationship. So this is just an objective, way of quantifying that process. So the original SIPS analog system that's been uh, available for about 10 years now, it's frequency-based. It uses the top 15 analogs that match the forecast in a uh, specific domain. It is not optimized for any particular hazard. It's, you know, it's just the matching analogs. How often at a grid point does a certain uh, field value or hazard show up. So in the example on the right here that I have, we have the severe weather report frequency. I've highlighted the area around St. Louis, which is showing about a 30% uh, frequency of uh, severe reports happening in that area. So that translates to about five out of 15 analogs having severe at that location. So looking at this new system, which is currently available. I will have the link in, in the final slide so that people can access it. Uh, it's currently just for severe weather hazards. It is logistic regression uh, based, which logistic regression, for those who don't know, is just a type of, um, I guess, a light version, if you will, of machine learning or artificial intelligence. It is used uh, fairly uh, a wide uh, across the this our, our field, atmospheric sciences, but also in, in other scientific fields where you're basically you're trying to produce a forecast a probabilistic forecast um, because it is a type of machine learning it, it can be naturally optimized for any particular hazard or field um, 
but why are we doing this now? You know, we've been doing it one way for 10 years and it, it works pretty well. You know, we get a lot of good uh, positive feedback on that system. So why are we changing things? Well, the frequency based version is fairly dependent upon the quality of the analogs. If you don't, if you know, for whatever reason, you don't have good quality matches, then obviously your output is going to suffer. With this version of the guidance, the, the logistic regression is, in a way to put it simply, able to read between the lines more so. So it's not quite as dependent upon the quality of the analogs as the frequency-based version. Although if the analogs are really, really poor matches, then yes, the, the output is not gonna be that great either. But it's, it's a bit more flexible, it's a bit more versatile. And um, also mainly, it's moving toward where the National Weather Service and the weather enterprise as a whole, the forecast enterprise is the direction they're moving in providing, uh, you know, trying to use, condense large amounts of data down into a nice, easy to consume package, if you will. And, you know, there's been a lot of documentation from the National Weather Service that's come out over the last 10 years or so in saying we need, you know, better, better guidance in, in the long term, say the four, day four to eight period. And we need uh, we need better better tools, and we need to start utilizing machine learning more. And in this most recent uh, roadmap, the in the the 2019-2022 strategic plan, I pulled this quote directly out of it, and and it states that integrating the power of human skill with the efficiency of new computing technology will revolutionize hazard forecasting, which is what we're doing severe weather, enabled by machine learning. We're using logistic regression, so that's you know check that box, and then advanced probabilistic tools so the output of our our guidance is a probabilistic tool so you know we're we're on the right path and this is you know the direction in which the agency is is heading so one downside to using this approach versus the frequency based guidance is it is somewhat of a black box you have this input which i'll explain more of this all here shortly but you have the input which we we take the gefs we take analogs that match the GEFS forecast, and we take the analog severe reports, throw them at the logistic regression, and then we get this output, which is a probabilistic forecast. And there's a lot that happens on in, in between there in that black box that you know can be a little bit confusing, can be a little bit intimidating. So the purpose of this presentation is to hopefully uh, provide clarification and, and understanding of what goes on so that if you do decide to utilize this guidance in the future, you can have an idea of why it is uh, saying what it says, why it came up with the solution that it did. So real quick rundown of how this works in producing probabilities. Step one, analogs are found based on the 24 to 192 hour forecast of the zero UTC initialization of the GEFS. Um, the way we find analogs are using the 12 fields that you see on the right. We have four mass fields, four thermal fields, and four moisture fields. So we just compare those fields in the analogs to those of the forecast. We have um, a, a scoring system, if you will. And then we take in step two, the top 100 scoring or top 100 matching analogs and their associated severe reports, if there are any, and use them to train the logistic regression model. So what that logistic regression model basically does is it looks at those same 12 fields you see on the right there in addition to CAPE and SIN and, and looks at the relationship uh, to severe weather uh, historically and, and tries to find a relationship between those fields and the severe weather reports. Once it does figure out that relationship, it applies it to the forecast and the output is step three, uh, the probability of a severe hazard within 110 kilometers of a grid point. Now, 110 kilometers is very coarse resolution. I, I understand that. And, you know, the direction in which, you know, we're, we're moving as, as in terms of the resolution of guidance and, and modeling that's provided, this is very coarse. Uh, initially, when we started this project back in 2016, uh, the version of the GEFS we were using, which it was a non-operational version, and the reforecast data set, this was the resolution of the guidance that was available to us, which did kind of work out in our favor because of just the computing power that we had. 
we were able to handle this resolution. So it's kind of a balance between what we are computationally able to handle and what was available to us. Additionally, it still kind of works out for the purpose of this guidance. It is to pick up on the synoptic scale, the large scale pattern in the extended range. We do offer the guidance, like I said, you know, 24 to 192 hours out, but the main focus is that day four to eight period. And at that time, you know, you're not going to be able, even, you know, if you had higher resolution guidance, there's still the, the finer scale details that, that may drive the magnitude, duration, and location of severe weather are going to be very unclear. But the synoptic scale is a little bit easier to pick up on at that, at that time interval. So we, as of now, we're pretty content with where that, at, where that is in terms of resolution. Um, we have thrown around, you know, increasing the resolution uh, once we're able to come into uh, additional computing power, hopefully in about a year or so. But um, yes, we are aware that that is pretty coarse and, you know, we are looking into uh, changing that. And then finally, step four, the, uh, we do this process in overlapping domains across the CONUS. And if a grid point has multiple domains overlapped on it, then those probabilistic values are averaged together. And kind of just what that looks like in, from the domains perspective, up in the left, we have how you know, how much the domains overlap from west to east. And then on the right, we have how much the domains overlap from north to south. And this happens across the entire CONUS. So getting into a little bit of what my research at St. Louis University was, is assessing this guidance across the year. So across each of the four seasons, and just trying to figure out you know, how it performs and then are there ways to increase its performance. So step one uh, in that process was to identify a, a best performing or an optimal analog and forecast source. The methods that we tested, you know, the combinations of the sources are seen below. You have method one, two, and three. Uh, method one is what we originally started with, testing and then uh, attempted to run operationally. If you're familiar with this this process, um, this is how, or this is the process in which the literature, the previous literature, suggests that you do if you're going to use a reforecast and in, in modeling system. Um, the reason for that is because you have this frozen; it's the non-operational version of the model, the GEFS, and the reforecasts are produced by that model as well. So you're comparing, you know. It's it's apples to apples. You're you know it's this it's using the same you know physics. It's it's got the same biases, etc. So you don't have to worry about incorporating or dealing with those those differences and the errors that that might come out of that. However, given that was the non-operational version of the model, uh, it wasn't you know it's it's not given primary um, computing resources. So by the time it the data came out and we were able to post-process it, it was being made available, zero Z guidance was being made available almost 18 hours later, you know, sometime around midday the following day. That, that's not useful uh, for, for anyone really. I mean, again, looking at, you know, trying to produce guidance in the extended term, you've got SPC forecasters in the early morning hours looking at writing their their forecast discussions and producing their probabilistic areas in the day four to eight period. You have all the forecasters at WFOs, you know, working on their grids and writing their AFDs in the early morning hours. We wanted this guidance to be available to them if they wanted to use it as, as soon as possible. So coming out in midday, not really a, a feasible option. So that's why we, we explored method two and three in using the NAR, the current uh, operational version of the GEFS and just using the NAR as the analog source. And that's kind of how the traditional SIPS analog system work. We use the NAR for the analogs and just use the current operational version of the model. Um, method two, I will say right now, method two is how the current version of the guidance works. We use the NAR for the analogs and we use the GEFS mean as a forecast source. However, for this research, um, we wanted to actually go with method three for a couple reasons. First, 
method two and three outperformed method one in, in the test cases we used. Um, this was pretty noticeable. And um, so it showed, hey, we still can use the NAR for analogs. We can use the operational version and the guidance still works and it works well. Uh, method two and three do perform similarly. So even though method three is the non-operational version currently, uh, any, any results and statistics I show later on are still comparable to method two, the, the current operational version. But method three allows for, again, you know, because we're using the operational uh, version of the model and, and the NAR, we can provide timely real-time guidance. Uh, because we're using the NAR, we can explore the use of multiple valid hours that the NAR data set has. You know, it's valid every three hours, whereas the GEFS read forecast data set was only uh, available at 0Z. That's the read forecasts are always uh, valid at 0Z. So a bit more uh, depth and data there. And then also the NAR data set extends back further in time historically than does the read forecast data set. So you're you know, you've got a little bit more cases to choose from in terms of finding quality analogs. And then also method three and in using the individual GEFF mem excuse me, GEFS members, we can play around with how we can utilize those members and, and trying to make the guidance uh, more useful. Now, how this version of the guidance works is very similar to how I've already described in terms of finding the analogs and, and calculating the logistic regression algorithm. Uh, the only difference is that for each of the members, we find the analogs and then combine all those analogs into one list, pull the top 100 analogs from all those members combined, and then use those to train the logistic, a uh, single logistic regression algorithm. That logistic regression algorithm then determines the relationship between severe and, and, and the analogs and applies that to then each member's forecast individually. Um, I will kind of talk about why that that might be an issue uh, later on and how we, we're looking into resolving that. So these are reliability diagrams uh, showing the performance of the probability of any severe hazard, so the accumulated severe product, if you will. Uh, so on, along the x-axis is the forecasted probability of the event occurring, and then along the y-axis is the observed frequency of that event occurring. So the thick black line that diagonally uh, goes through the center of those uh, plots is essentially a, a perfect forecast. And so you want your reliability curves, which are the colored lines, to be as close to that line as possible. And in, in this case, the warmer colors are, are shorter lead times. The legend is down there at the bottom of the, uh, uh, bottom of the page. And then as you get toward the cooler colors, those are extended lead times. Uh, so we see looking at the top left, spring, top right is summer, bottom left is fall, bottom right is winter. Uh, overall, the guidance performs well. We are, we are pretty happy with what we saw. Um, as you note, as you may note, uh, the forecast hour 168, which is the blue curve, and forecast hour 192, which is the purple curve, in most of the seasons is doesn't perform as well as the short to kind of mid-range uh, forecast hours. That's to be expected. Um, you know, obviously there's, you know, a lot of model uncertainty at that range and then whether we are using the mean of the GEFS or you know what I just said in the previous slide and what this is showing is that we're combining all the analogs from all the members and using them to train us a, a single logistic regression algorithm you're kind of almost still incorporating the mean of the members in a way so you know, as ensemble member or yes, ensemble member spread increases in the extended term, extended range, you're going to see, you know, performance take a little bit of a of a dip. So that's that's to be expected. But overall, we are pretty happy with how it performed. This is now looking at the probability of severe wind. Oh, and one thing I, I should mention is that this is uh, the guidance's performance on. 50 cases so each season has 50 cases uh, that we tested this on uh, so probability of severe wind uh, given that's the predominant severe type for each season uh, this looks pretty similar to the probability of any severe hazard uh, nothing nothing too crazy we do see it handles wind specifically a little bit better in the summer than it did the accumulated severe looking at the probability of severe hail 
Uh, again, overall, spring and fall, we perform fairly well. Uh, in the winter, there's a little bit of a under forecast issue, but still, you know, we do see that increase in probability related well to an increase in, in the observ observed severe. Uh, summer, we do have a little bit of an issue where uh, as you get into higher probabilities and as you go further out into the forecast period, the guidance doesn't perform quite as well. And I'll get in, into that a little bit uh, later on in, in ways that we did try to uh, address that. Uh, probability of tornado, spring and fall, we are very happy with how this performed uh, across all the forecast hours. Winter, again, similar to to the performance of hail, we do see a little bit of a under forecast issue here, but again, we still do see a good relationship between an increase in probability means an increase in the observed frequency of the event. But summer, uh, shorter lead times, say day one to three, uh, perform fairly well, but as you get further out into the extended period, we do see a little bit of a drop off in performance. So looking at when it comes to finding analogs, we use those 12 fields like I showed earlier. How often are those fields used as a, as a, or show up as one of the top three scoring fields in the analogs? That's how we score the analogs is, is uh, compare each of the fields and see how well they compare to that of the forecast. So uh, this shows that 300 and 500 heights typically match the most. Uh, across all the seasons, followed by kind of your your 850 and mean sea level pressure fields, and then the the upper to mid level temperature fields uh, for for all the seasons. You do see a little bit of an increase in in the matching when it comes to uh, the moisture parameters during the winter months, but predominantly it is the 300 and 500 uh, height fields that are used when when matching analogs the most often. Probably a bit more of a useful uh, plot in terms of trying to figure out why the logistic regression does what it does, produces what it does. Is this is a very similar plot as the one I showed earlier. However, this is these are the fields that the logistic regression algorithm uses uh, the most when trying to determine the probability of severe weather at a given grid point. And what we see here again is that the height fields and mean sea level pressure are used uh, most often across each of the four seasons. Um, I mean, it's very clear to see a little bit less in the summer and you do see uh, a bit more use out of the moisture fields during the summer, but for the most part, it's, it's the height fields and mean sea level pressure. And just basically what that means is that whether you know logistic regression is bumping the probability up or down at a grid point, it's using the height fields the most to determine whether or not it should do that. So just a real quick uh, analysis on that portion of the research. Um, the guidance performs well overall. Uh, we do see a bit of a performance issue at extended lead times, particularly at hours 168 and 192. The probability of severe hail and tornado uh, suffer a little bit, particularly in the extended range during the summer. And the winter probability of tornado, we do have a bit of an under forecasting issue there. But you know, just keep in mind that as you do see an increase in probability of say tornado during the winter, you are, you know, it is expected that you will see an increase in the observations of tornadoes. Um, height fields are used most often to determine the probability at a grid point by the logistic regression. Briar skill scores and rock skill scores showed an improvement over the frequency based forecast. I didn't show any data on that just for the sake of time, but this version of the guidance does have an edge over the frequency based guidance that we've been using over the last 10 years. Um, one thing I also didn't show is that the guidance performs similarly spatially across the US uh, for each season, for each hazard. I, I didn't, there wasn't really any uh, substantial or noticeable or useful differences in the guidance's performance using various uh, statistical measures. So not really any useful information in terms of the spatial uh, performance. To, to kind of have a better idea of, of any strengths or weaknesses of the guidance, we, we did uh, some case studies and we found that this is kind of a no-brainer. The guidance performs best when you have your shear and instability parameter space overlapping. That's that's pretty much severe weather forecasting 101. So 
I mean, you know, that's kind of a dub, but at the same time, hey, you know that it's, it's, you know, it's accurately picking up on where it should be. It also performs best when the severe threat is centered in time close to zero UTC, which is when the guidance is always valid at. Um, where we see the guidance perform poorly is with quick hitting small scale features that produce severe weather. Obviously, you know, the resolution that we use at the time interval that we use it, we're going to miss features like that. You know, this, this isn't about picking up on those. It's about picking up on, you know, large scale synoptic pattern features that are going to drive, you know, significant, you know, huge spatial and, and temporal extent severe, severe episodes. If uh, another weak spot is if the severe threat is displaced too far from zero UTC, the valid time, we do see a, a, a drop off in performance. This primarily seems to happen in the overnight hours after a six UTC that we see if, if there's a, a pretty significant severe threat occurring after that time, the guidance has issues uh, picking up on it. And then areas of weak to ne negligible forcing and shear, but high instability, it likes to to pick up on uh, showing that there is severe potential there, probably a little bit higher than it should, uh, given given the environment. But it it does have this uh, this instability bias, this cape bias, and we'll discuss that more in the upcoming slides. So here's an example of uh, how the instability bias looks in the summer. This is the derecho event from June 29th, 2012, and I'd like to just first point out that. We were pretty happy with how well the guidance picked up on this event. This, you know, it wasn't, and looking at forecast discussions and other guidance available uh, for this event, it, it wasn't, you know, there was discussion of that something of this magnitude was possible in the days ahead of time, but it wasn't very clear until really, you know, within that 24 hour window leading up to the event. And we see that starting at forecast hour 144 down in the bottom and, and moving up through forecast hour 24, that the guidance really had high confidence in, in a severe event occurring in that area. But the main reason why I'm showing this is that you do see a lot of noise. This is the uh, pixelated version. You can also, uh, in the, in the real-time guidance available online, switch between this and then kind of a smoothed filled contour version. But just for the sake of showing how noisy this can get in the summer, here's a pixelated version. And we see a lot of pixels in, in the Southeast and, and kind of the mid Mississippi Valley, particularly in the extended range that, you know, it, it kind of, it, you can't really get a good signal out of that. So um, what's going on here? Well, as I said, you know, just where the shear and uh, Cape, the instability are able, able to overlap, that's where it's going to pick up on the greatest signal. However, as we notice here in the uh, zero to six kilometer bulk shear on the left and surface base cape on the right, this is valid. Um, this is SPC reanalysis valid at zero UTC for this event. We have really no shear across the Southeast where we are still seeing, you know, these, these areas of, of low to mid confidence, you know, probability intervals, but there's a lot of cape. And so, you know, we're we're sitting underneath probably you know a ridge where you're you're going to be experiencing most likely, if anything, air mass thunderstorms. You know, real quick pulse severe that's going to probably produce low and severe. And so it, it's our hypothesis that it's these types of events that are kind of polluting the data set and cause, if you will, and cause that noise that we see. So that was how it looks in the summer. It also kind of manifests itself. Uh, during the winter as well. So here's the uh, case from December 23rd, uh, 2015, a pretty significant tornado event across northern Mississippi and then, uh, you know, all severe modes across the mid Mississippi Valley region into the Ohio Valley region. And what we notice here uh, with the guidance down, down along the bottom is that really when the signal started to come in, say around forecast hour 144 and forecast hour 120, the higher probabilities were were tied to the Gulf, you know, tied to, to southern Mississippi primarily, and remained that way up through the day one period, even though there were higher probabilities, uh, more so up along where the uh, primary boundary was through the Midwest, you know, the, the high, the, the guidance really wanted to focus on southern Mississippi, where if you look at the severe storms or severe report map up at the top, 
there really wasn't any severe weather in southern or mid Mississippi. So what's going on here? Again, just you know, zero six kilometer bulk shear on the left, surface base cape on the right. We see with surface base cape, you know, it's 2,000 joules per kilogram of cape down there across southern Mississippi, and the guidance really wanted to focus on that versus you know when it should have been focusing a little bit more on where you know still a decent amount of cape and you know good shear were were overlapping uh, further poleward. Um, so even though that the guidance did pick up on on the severe threat in general where where it was for the most part, um, it still like the the main focus was a little off. So we did attempt in at least the summer to try to combat this. Um, first, we and we just tested kind of spitballing, just trying different ways to see what we could what we could come up with. Um, the first uh, attempt was just to remove Cape and Sin from the logistic regression calculation. So just it, it we weren't having the logistic regression algorithm look at those at uh, those fields. When we did this, we didn't notice any difference in the performance compared to the original version. So, okay, well, that doesn't work. The next step we took was to increase the, the lower threshold for severe reports that were used to train the logistic regression algorithm. So, you know, we bumped up hail reports. I, I do know that, you know, the, the criteria now for severe hail is one inch, but it's still, you know, going back in, in time, it's still in the data set as 0.75 inches. We just initially decided to leave it at that but we wanted to see okay if we take out that lower threshold you know from analogs that you know going back before it changed to one inch what would it do uh, we upped re wind reports and tornado reports and when we did this we actually noticed a decrease in performance uh, in each field or in each uh, probabilistic forecast compared to the base version so it's like okay we we shouldn't do that the next thing we tried was the removal of surface-based fields. Uh, this is based on work by Jensini et al. in 2014. Uh, who They found that uh, surface-based NAR fields have biases when compared to observational data. So uh, the list of fields that we removed can be seen there. And I don't actually show the results just for the sake of time, but there were slight changes in the guidance, you know, not really for, for better or for worse, but just little differences. But we did notice a, a subtle increase in performance, particularly in the summer. Um, so just to kind of summarize that particular section, uh, we didn't see, you know, adjusting the base thresholds for severe reports didn't help the summer performance. Uh, changing the fields but used by logistic regression did show some promise, but we don't want to just you know, we want to be able to do a more thorough analysis on that. So we're just not, you know, seemingly randomly adding and taking away fields. We want to have a bit more scientific approach than that. So we need to further look into that, that maybe there's a better combination of fields that we can use that would not only help the guidance during the summer, but help the guidance overall throughout the entire year. However, that particular uh, part of the research did show that the upper level fields are, are more useful for determining probability as when we remove the surface fields, it, the guidance didn't get worse. If anything, it got a little bit better. So, um, you know, there's that. And one thing to keep in mind uh, that we, you know, we, we did have to, you know, be mindful of is that any alteration to the logistic regression algorithm or just the guidance as a whole, it, it needs to be flexible or be able to be applied year round. Because say we find something that works really well for the summer, but it causes, you know, let's say the spring and the fall events to suffer a little bit, you know, the atmosphere doesn't adhere to a calendar. You know, whereas we we would essentially flip a switch like, OK, it's summer now. This is how the, the guidance needs to run. If you have, you know, a more spring like event bleeding over into the summertime it might cause the guidance to not handle that as well. So that's something we have to keep in mind in, in any adjustments we make that they need to be able to be applied year round. One adjustment that we were able to find that increased the performance of the guidance year round was using um, multiple valid hours from the NAR. So the base version and the current operational version that you have access to now just uses NAR analogs valid at zero UTC. But the NAR is uh, available every three hours. So uh, just because for the sake of uh, conserving computing power and then just also that we thought every three hours was probably a 
bit too much. Just it wasn't going to be that useful um, for just the way the guidance is set up currently. We we used analogs from every six hours to find, or we used NAR valid hours every six hours to find analogs. And what we saw was an increase in performance. So in the left column, that's the original version, the base version, which you've already seen those reliability diagrams. On the right is the multi-hour analog version. Um, the top rows in this panel is the spring, and then the bottom row is summer. And what we see is an increase in performance across all forecast hours. You see that the, the reliability curves get a little bit closer to, to that, that perfect forecast line in both the short term and extended term, although, you know, obviously the extended term could perform a little bit better. And this is true for both the spring and the summer. Looking now at, for, at the fall across the top and then winter across the bottom, uh, we do see a little bit of an increase in performance in the fall. Not as much in the winter, but still we, it, it didn't hurt. You know, it didn't, we still see this increase in, in probability correlate well with a increase in observed frequency except for you know in in the day seven and eight range so how does this alteration affect what the guidance looks like here we have an example april 27 2011 this is you know the the big one down across the southeast uh here along the bottom the top row is the original version of the guidance which just uses zero utc nor analogs and then the bottom row is the version of the guidance that uses multiple valid hours from the NAR. And forecast hour 24 on the left, moving forward or moving toward you know the extended range as you go to the right. And what we see is that at least starting looking at the day one period, that the guidance uh, better handles the severe risk across you know Mississippi and Alabama by extending that you know that 75% contour further down into Mississippi, which I would say is appropriate given what happened that day. But the main thing that I took away from this is the inclusion of the severe threat as it moved up toward New England. You don't really see that so much, or the probability, or excuse me, the guidance doesn't handle that as well with the, the zero UTC NAR analog version. But with this multi-hour version, you see that it does have higher probabilities up there in that area where severe weather did occur. And this is true, you know, moving forward, forecast hour 48, 72, 96 uh, is just better handling of the severe threat, you know, better encompassing of the severe threat across the southeast, but also across the northeast as well. And this is now looking at the day uh, uh, five to eight period too, from, from left to right. And again, you know, obviously, you know, it's pretty common to see a decrease in the signal, you know, this far out in the extended range, but it still is, I feel, better encompasses the magnitude of, of the event and also the, the spatial and thus temporal extent of the event. Here's another example, the uh, Super Tuesday outbreak of February 5th, 2008. Uh, a similar scheme across the top is the zero UTC NAR analog version and the bottom is the multi-hour version. And uh, here's a, a kind of highlights how this version of the guidance, this newer or this multi-hour approach can combat the, the CAPE or the instability issue. As we see in forecast hour 24, and then maybe a little bit of forecast hour 48, that the guidance is wanting to, to highlight the, the heart of the, the severe threat a little bit further south than it actually was, probably where there is more uh, instability available. However, using the multi-hour approach, we do see that the uh, guidance better highlights the heart of the uh, severe threat in the day one to two and then uh, moving forward. We do see, you know, it, it doesn't incorporate the severe reports as well as they kind of moved into the, uh, the Ohio River Valley. And again, those reports were, were primarily after six UTC. And that again is, as I pointed out earlier, a, a potential weakness of the guidance is that those, those very late night, very early morning events, it, it doesn't handle quite as well. But overall, we were impressed with how using multiple hours from the NAR data set uh, improved this, this particular case. And this is now looking at the day five through eight period. Uh, also, one thing to point out, you, you see like particularly in the, in the day seven and eight range that the guidance, you know, it's kind of low, low end threat um, and not positioned where it should be. This is, 
this may be a no-brainer, but the, the guidance is tied to the GEFS. So the performance of the GEFS is going to impact the guidance. If the GEFS is proposing a different solution at that range than what actually ends up happening in reality, then the guidance is going to do the same thing too. So just something to keep in mind. But another thing is that uh, something that we've noticed is that the guidance doesn't commonly produce areas of probability at, at this range. So if you if it's during the winter months and you see something like this, it's just something to keep an eye on. So another version of the guidance that we tested out was using individual, or excuse me, the ensemble members individually. In this case, we didn't have the overlapping domains. We still had the domains, but they just butted up against each other and uh, instead of overlapping. And that allows us for, you know, I guess to reduce the smoothing that goes on. So when it comes to producing a probabilistic value at a grid point, you're not averaging together the on the the value from each ensemble member and then the domains on top of that. It's just you know just taking into account the the values produced by the ensemble members. And so each member is processed individually. The analogs that are found for each member are kept separate. Uh, and then those are used to train a logistic regression algorithm separate for each member. And then that relationship between, you know, the historical patterns and severe that the logistic regression finds are then applied specifically to that member. And so what this allows for is the use of percentile statistics, which you can see various ways of, of doing this on, on the right. Um, we show uh, this is uh, a day eight forecast for the April 27, 2011 event valid at zero UTC. And you can do look at things such as the median, uh, the spread. And then, you know, if you want to use or, you know, in this case, we calculated the 25th and 75th percentile. And this just gives we feel this this allows for forecasters to better assess the, you know, I guess a measure of confidence of the confidence of the guidance at that range, just to get a better idea of what could potentially happen versus just simply using the mean, which is currently used. Um, this also allows, I, I don't have a, a slide for this, but you can, or we've we've played around with plotting the output from each member individually. Uh, those are known as stamp maps so that you can, if you really wanna get into the details and look at everything thoroughly yourself, you can do that. Um, but again, this, this particular method requires a lot of computing power um, that we currently don't have, so it is um, it's still probably at least a year away from from doing anything like this. So on that note, just the future of SIPs, uh, in particular with the severe guidance, additional computing power will allow for using the multiple NAR hours for analogs, which I showed really helped increase the performance of the guidance in a lot of different ways, kind of help mitigate at least in 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 the winter that that cape or that instability bias. Um, it allow us to process each ensemble member uh, completely individually, which will hopefully, at least in the extended term or extended range forecast, make the guidance more useful. You know, we're, we're dealing with an on, ensemble and at that range you, you get increased ensemble spread and that when, if you're, if you're using the ensemble mean or trying to incorporate the ensemble members together in some way that can possibly kind of reduce the usefulness or you know reduce the the signal or or whatever of the guidance at that range it also additional computing power will also allow us to potentially uh, push the guidance to a, a higher resolution um, additionally guidance for uh, additional hazards and fields will be produced by this method dr graves is working on this right now he hopes to have it out sometime later this year um, so, you know, tip, how the SIPS system is now where you can look at different, you know, snow products and, and temperature products that will all be produced by this method. And then in terms of the web page, the short and long term guidance will com be combined into one common framework. And instead of right now, it's it's basically two different types of of, I guess you could say, viewing processes. So uh, I'll wrap it up here. Um, just to summarize, we, we currently have real-time severe guidance available. Uh, the link for that is there on the right in, in blue. Um, the, you can't access it from, if you, if you use the, the frequency-based guidance that we've had available for the last 10 years, you can't access this version of the guidance from that page. You have to go to this link specifically. Um, 
this also shows, or this research, this, you know, the studies we did with, with this guidance shows that the synoptic scale pattern and synoptic scale variables, if you will, can be used to produce the probability of severe weather. Um, the mid to upper level fields in this, in that case, are utilized more than, than surface or, or lower fields. Um, the guidance does have a, a bit of an instability bias, which is just something to, to keep in mind, uh, particularly during the summer. You know, your low end uh, probability values are probably not as accurate. You need to look for that, that higher, those higher probabilistic thresholds to really uh, pick out where the severe threat is. And then also just something to keep in mind during the winter if you see, uh, you know, a higher probabilistic threshold centered more toward the Gulf when you're expecting the severe threat to be more poleward. And then finally, the use of multiple NAR valid hours for analogs and processing the members individually increase the usefulness of the guidance. And hopefully we can implement that uh, within about a year or so. So our contact information is up there on the right, slu.sips at gmail.com. Uh, Dr. Graves, Dr. Gravel, and myself, at the very least, there might be some other people have access to that email and we all get notifications if you send uh, an email to that account. So hopefully one of us re will respond. If not, feel free to just keep on pestering us. Um, we have a Twitter page. Additionally, um, myself, I will be uh, shortly in about a week uh, starting my, my time as a forecaster at the St. Louis WFO. So if you see me on chat or want to hit me up via my no email of, about any questions related to uh, the SIPs analog guidance, uh, feel free to contact me. And there's a link to the real-time guidance right there, as I said. So um, I don't know if you're on right now, Jim. Uh, if if I could just take a couple minutes to to kind of cruise the real-time page and show people how it works. Yeah, I think that would be fantastic, especially given uh, tomorrow's uh, probabilities. Yes. Okay. So can every, uh, can you see that? Just making sure it's still working. I can. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. So here's what the um, this uh, real-time severe guidance page looks like. Up across the top, you'll notice these values. The one on the far left is highlighted in blue. Those are the run dates. So you can go back in time, uh, eight or nine days, depending on how you count, uh, to look at what each of those runs produced. Uh, below that, you see this all severe is highlighted. Um, actually, let me go to, so we have the day two period. So that's that's interesting. SPC has it outlooked, I believe, or last I checked, they might've updated it. Um, it was a slight, but so here's what the guidance is, is looking at for tomorrow. Up at the top here, below those uh, run dates, you have this all severe wind and hail, wind, hail and tornado. So you can toggle between each of those uh, probabilistic areas. We don't have an outlook or we don't have an area for tornado. So the guidance isn't thinking too highly of uh, tornadoes tomorrow. Uh, moving to the right, you can switch between the filled contours, which is what we're displaying right now, and the pixels and contours. So this is, it's the contours are the exact same. It's just showing the pixels underneath, I guess you could say the filled contours. Um, down below at the bottom, you see like this day one, forecast hour 24, day two, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how you can switch between each day, you know, from this valid or from the initialization, what the forecast is. If you click on the date below those, that'll pull up a separate page where you can see the forecasts uh, valid for that date that the guidance has produced. If the guide or if the, the event hasn't happened yet or the forecast isn't available because it hasn't been produced yet, then it'll say not available. Once an event does happen, you will see these panels down at the bottom populate with the severe reports. So you can do a direct comparison in how the guidance was uh, producing these probabilistic areas and where the severe reports occurred, kind of like a, just a eyeballing verification. Up at the left, you can just hit that button to return back to the, to the main page. Um, over on the right, we have a readout. The top link though is uh, the threat guidance for this run. So you can look at the eight day forecast at a glance based on that uh, initial, initialization you have selected and you can select the different initializations across the top. Uh, going back to this page. So let me do this. I will say right now, so 
The day two, four, six, and eight period, uh, there is a little bit of a bug where you click inside the area and it doesn't tell you the significant atmospheric fields. So I will just go to, and we are working on addressing that. Uh, looking at the day three period, which there currently is also an SBC outlook for that one as well, um, across the south. So um, clicking within that probabilistic area, I personally like to choose the pixel and contours version so you can actually see what pixels uh, you're selecting. And that little gray dot will tell you what pixel you have selected. And it'll this readout on the side will tell you what the value of the probability of severe is the climatological frequency of severe at that location. And then the, the significant atmospheric fields are uh, the fields that the logistic regression used the most to determine the probability of severe weather at that grid point. Below that, we have the top five most similar analogs. Each of these dates are clickable and you click on it and it opens up uh, a SIPS page that shows the different uh, fields, surface observations, weather hazards from that specific date. So this is kind of more harkening back to the traditional analog system. And then down at the very bottom, we have different measures of confidence for assessing the, I guess you could say the strength or the accuracy of the probabilistic forecast. Uh, this is based on uh, the analog. So it, it, the guidance, you know, it's, it learns from the analogs and then we basically then turn around and apply it to the analogs just to see how it would perform on basically what it studied and these, this is how it performed basically. So if it perform, performs like crap on, on the, the cases it studied, you may not have as much confidence in you know, a particular grid points probability. And each of these uh, value or each of these uh, I guess words, characters, phrases, if it if it highlights, it's clickable. And so if you want an explanation of what exactly you're looking at, so significant atmospheric fields, you click on that and it pops up with uh, an explanation of, of what that is. And there is down at the bottom, uh, you see this text here for more information, click here, clicking there, that'll uh, download a, a two page white page uh, PDF that just gives a brief explanation of the guidance, how it works, et cetera. Um, so that's that's how the web page works. And um, like I said, if you have any questions at all, feel free to con contact us uh, via any of the uh, ways I explained earlier. And if there's time, I'll be happy to take questions now. All right, very good. Thank you, Alex. I sure appreciate it. Um